There was a woman who'd had a difficult life. She lived in the northern kingdom of Israel and lived there with her husband and her two sons. They lived during the time when Ahab, the apostate king, was on the throne. And Jezebel, his wicked queen, brought into the land the worship of Baal. Her husband was a prophet of God. And so during that time, he had to go into hiding because Jezebel was trying to kill all of the prophets of God. But then one day, things began to change. There was a showdown on Mount Carmel. And Elijah the prophet called down fire from heaven that consumed the sacrifice. And it shifted the whole culture of the nation. Elijah wasn't able to bring spiritual revival to the entire nation. But there was a dramatic change at that time. And there began to be an uprising of the prophets once again. The school of the prophets reformed. And the nation began to move in a bit of a different direction. He was able to come out of hiding. He was able to once again go about his normal activities and, and be a prophet of God in Israel. However, the drought that had been in the land for three and a half years and his time in hiding had left the family in a very difficult financial position. There were many creditors and he was trying to hold off the creditors until one day the unthinkable happened. He died. He died a premature death. And he left a widow and two sons there in a very difficult situation as the creditors suddenly come to try to take everything that they have. And that's the story we're looking at today. You can find it over in 2 Kings chapter 4. Because all of us at one time or another are going to be in a desperate situation where only God can intervene. And that's the situation we're going to find today. And through it, we're going to learn lessons about how God can miraculously provide. So in verse 1, we read, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. You see, they were one of the 7,000 in Israel that had not bowed their knee to Baal. And the creditor is coming to take away my two sons to be his slaves. When you hear about them being slaves, I don't want you to think about New World slavery, pre-Civil War. That was essentially kidnapping when they made people slaves. And the Bible forbid any of that. However, there was a slavery. And that slavery essentially was indentured slavery. If somebody came into a position financially where they had all kinds of creditors, they had all kinds of debt, and there was no way they could repay it, they could actually become a servant or an indentured slave to people that they owed the money to. So they would work, and they couldn't work no matter how much the debt is, more than seven years as a slave, then they had to be let go. They were treated very humanely, their needs were met, but they worked for no wages. And during the year of Jubilee, if you happened to live during that time, you were supposed to be released from that slavery as well, no matter how long you'd been serving. That's the state that her sons are going to find themselves in if they cannot pay the creditors. They're going to be enslaved. And I'd have to say that we live in a time when there is a generation of young people who are enslaved. So many are enslaved to immorality, the occult, drugs, alcohol, spiritual blindness, confusion, and despair. The suicide rates have been on the rise, and young people feel ravaged by what's going on in the culture. And like this family, we need God to intervene and bring an intervention to bring miraculous deliverance to this generation. Now, in addition to this tragedy with the boys potentially being enslaved, what it would do to the widow was even more horrific. Because a woman in that day had no means of support if she didn't have a family. So with her husband dead and her son's indentured servants, she is going to have nothing to survive on. Now, remember, this is a different era. A different era in which, than which we live in. It was the era of the prophet, priest, and king. In the Old Testament, they were the ones anointed by God. And if you wanted a word from God, you needed to go to the prophet. 
The Bible was not readily available at that time, and it would have only been the Old Testament and not all of the Old Testament. They probably would have had an opportunity to read the book of Deuteronomy, but for this family, they probably didn't even have that at this time. And so if you wanted a word from God, you went to the prophet. We live in a different time. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 said, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. You see, in that day, they went to the prophet. They went to the priest. Today, we don't need a mediator. The Bible says we can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Aren't you glad that we can go directly to the God of heaven? We can go directly to the king of the universe. Now, this was a different time. And Old Testament believers would have seen Elisha as the word of God for their generation. They would have seen him as the representative of God. So they would have gone to him. Now, I want you to understand that isn't true today. I believe prophets still exist, but they're never to direct your life with their words. You never go to a prophet to find out how you're to live and what you're to do. All their words are our confirmation of what God has already told you. Because you have the canon of Scripture, both Old and New Testament. You have the Word of God, which is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. It will direct you. And you have the Holy Spirit that now can prompt you and lead you and guide you in alignment with the Scripture. But in that day, they needed a prophet. And so she goes to Elisha, the man of God, the man who represented God. God, and she cries out to him. And this is my first observation from the text. We must cry out to God in faith. When you need miraculous provision, it's a time to cry out to God. You see, prayer shouldn't be our last resort. It should be our first response, no matter what the situation is. And God responds to desperate faith-filled cries. In Jeremiah 33, 3, we read, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. When the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness, we read in Psalm 107, verse 6, that they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. God is attracted to humility. And when you cry out to him, it demonstrates a humility. It's saying, God, I can't handle life on my own. I need you. I need your intervention. I need your assistance. In Psalm 9, 12, it tells us that God does not forget the cry of the humble. And throughout the scripture, you see people crying out to God and God responding in miraculous ways. You see this in the life of Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus is going through Jericho, and there's a blind man. His name is Bartimaeus, and he begins to call out, and he cries out to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, the crowd says, settle down, quiet down, don't be disruptive, but he keeps crying out even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, and Jesus responds, and the man has a recovery of his sight by a miracle Jesus performs. Now, I want you to think about it. What if he had listened to the crowd? What if he'd allowed them to pull back? What if their doubt had gotten on him? He would have never seen his miracle. Folks, you need to cry out to God no matter what your family thinks, no matter what your friends think, no matter how unbelief may try to creep into your life. We have a God who responds to the cries of his people. We see it again in Matthew 15. There was a woman in even a more desperate situation. She had a daughter who, again, was enslaved. She was demonized. And she's a woman of Canaan, which means as a Syrophoenician woman, she had no right to the covenant of God. In that day, she had no right to Jesus and his miracle working power until after he would rise from the dead. And so because of that, she had no reason to go to God in the natural. 
But we have a God who is compassionate and loving and loves to reach out to those who are hurting. So this woman comes and she's crying out to Jesus, asking for assistance, asking for help, crying out. And the disciples say, shut her up. She's driving us crazy. But the woman won't shut up. She persistently cries out and she even reasons with Jesus. And Jesus is testing her faith. He's drawing out faith in her. And Jesus responds to her cries and her daughter is delivered. Folks, we live in such a day where we need to cry out. We read in James chapter 5 verse 16 that the effectual fervent prayers of righteous people avail much. I want you to understand it's not the volume of the cry. It's the focus of the cry. This isn't mundane. This isn't perfunctory. This is pressing in, focus, crying out to God. He's our focus. It's not something we just go through, little prayers we pray, but we are crying out with God as our focus. And we need to be crying out for this generation of young people. I believe we live in an hour where it is critical that the church of Jesus Christ makes a decision. We will see revival. We will see an awakening among our young people. We will see them set ablaze with the glory of God. On Wednesday, August 23rd, the women of Radiant Church, these mama bears, are going to come together at our central campus and call out to God for this generation of young people. And I believe we can see a youth revolution because God responds to the cries of his people. Verse 2 goes on to say, So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Now I want you to see this. Elisha is not unconcerned. He cares about this woman. He listens to what this woman has to say. He has compassion on her. And I want to let you know that's how our God is. Elisha, in many ways, is a representative of Jesus here. He is Jesus before Jesus. He is a representative of God to this woman. And so she's coming to him, and, and he says, what can I do for you? I want to let you know when you go to God, he says, what can I do for you? And he wants us to be very specific. Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus is easily touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The reason is the incarnation. You see, God became one of us. He's not some distant deity who doesn't care and doesn't understand. You see, when you go to God and you say, God, I am hurting. I feel rejected. Jesus can say, yeah, I felt rejected too. Because he lived it. He did it. When we go to God and we say, God, I feel abandoned. He said, I was abandoned. Say, well, I'm in pain. He says, I know pain. I've experienced pain. But I have a financial need. He says, oh, I suffered poverty in my own life. Jesus understands. He recognizes our problem and he deeply cares. I am so glad we have a God who cares. I'm so glad he's not a God that is distant. A great God who will do nothing for us and doesn't have compassion on it. He is easily touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And I want you to remember that. And if you ever start to forget it, look to the cross. Where Jesus Christ went to the cross for your and my sin. That's how much he cares. When you say, God, how much do you care Look at the stretched out arms of Jesus. That's how much he cares. And Romans 8.32 says he did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us. And if he freely gave him up for us, how much will he more freely give us all things? Verse 2 goes on. Tell me, says Elisha, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Now I want you to see what she's focused on. She's focused on what she doesn't have. You know, the jar of oil is an afterthought. She's focused on what she doesn't have. So here's my second observation. Give God what you have. You see, Elisha's looking for something God can work through because God works through stuff. Remember, he used a stick to cause the axe head to float. He had them dig ditches in order to see the miraculous supply of water. So often we're focused on what we don't have where God's focused on what we do have. I think about Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000. You remember Jesus is speaking and thousands of people. We don't know how many. There's 5,000 men. There may have been 15,000 in the audience. And he tells his disciples, give them something to eat. And what's their focus? What they don't have. 
They say, where are we ever going to find enough food to feed all of these in the wilderness? And what does Jesus say? He says, what do you have? What do you have? And they say, well, you know, we got these five little loaves of bread, just little, little bitty pieces of bread, and we have two little fish. And Jesus says, okay, I'll use that. I want you to think about that. They became part of the miracle. Put yourself in the head of one of the disciples. And you're to go and feed them. And think about it. As they divide that food among 12, they just have a few crumbs and like a sardine in their hand. And they're looking at thousands of people. What are they going to do? Well, you know, they just gave a little bit of it. And then they go to the next person, a little bit. Why? They had a scarcity mentality. There's only so much. But this God that we serve is more than enough. And so they would give out the, and then they notice it just keeps growing in their hands. And so they go give and give and give. And then I imagine by the end, they're throwing just all kinds of food out there because it's just multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Or I think about Moses. God comes to Moses and he said, I'm going to use you to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses gives all the excuses. I can't, I can't, I, 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 I can't talk very well. He gives all his excuses, all of his reasons why he can't do it. And God says, what's in your hand? A rod. And God says, okay, I'll use that. And he uses that rod to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt and take them all the way to the land of Canaan and just to the border. Folks, I got to tell you, God isn't looking for how brilliant you are because here's what we do. We say, God, if I only had a better education, Oh, God, if I only had more money, if I was only more connected, God says, I'm not interested in what you don't have. I'm interested in what you do have. What do you have? Because whatever you have, I'm going to use that. And I think God's asking us today that. What do we have? What is in our hand? Paul tells the Corinthians, don't think about giving according to what you don't have, but what do you have? What do you have? God is always wanting us to participate in the miracle. Now, I want you to see that. Elisha doesn't come with a magic wand and wave it, and suddenly all their needs are met. He says, what do you have? You're going to participate. And I've got to tell you, I've struggled with this over the years. Many of you don't know my story, but years ago, uh, I was in college, and I had a friend who wanted to go into business And he said, let's start a business together. Well, we were going to go into real estate, but interest rates at that time were like 18% for a house. Can you imagine that? That's almost unthinkable now. But they were 18% for a house. So we decided real estate probably isn't a good idea. So his idea was that we go into a business that included commercial carpet cleaning and janitorial maintenance. Well, we were the most unlikely people to do something like that. Let me tell you my degree of mechanical aptitude. Zero. I mean, you hand me a screwdriver. I don't know what to do with it. Do I turn that righty or lefty? I can't quite remember. Uh, You know, that's me. In fact, if there's something to be done at my house, I say, Kelly, come help us. You know, do this. Because she's the one who can do it. I have no mechanical ability. So we start this company. And I'm a fair manager. And he's an incredible salesman. So before long, we become the biggest commercial carpet cleaning company in the entire city, and we have no idea what we're doing. But we have to buy equipment, and we have to hire employees. So even though we don't know what we're doing, we have a payroll, and we have a monthly payment for our equipment. And so we're building this business. We still don't know what we're doing, and we're not making a lot of money. It keeps growing, but the money isn't growing. And then we both have a realization. We're not good at this. And we decide this isn't what we're supposed to be doing with our life. He decides he's supposed to be in politics. And during that time, I committed my life to Jesus Christ. And so because of that, all I could see myself doing was ministry. I I sensed I was called into ministry. So we continue the business. I go back to school after taking a year out. And so in other words, I don't sleep. I'm working all day and I'm going to school all night and I'm just going back and forth. And it's just a crazy time. So what are we going to do? Well, finally we decide we're going to sell a portion of our business. We're going to sell the commercial carpet cleaning end of our business. And we were going to keep the most lucrative part of the business, some contracts we had for janitorial. 
So we sell it and we're thinking this is working out great. And then the people who bought it defaulted on the contract. And we get the equipment back without any of our business back. And so we're in deep trouble. So what do we do? Well, I had a brilliant idea and I presented it to God. There was a thing called the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes. And I just knew God was going to have me win that. It was over a million dollars. You know, I checked it the other day. It's $10 million now. $10 million. So I entered it when I went and looked. But anyway, I just knew that's how God's going to do it. That's how he's going to meet my need. And let me tell you, that is not how he met my need. And some of you are like that. You think God is going to swoop down in some dramatic miracle to meet your need. And usually he uses us. So he says to the woman, what do you have? And she says, well, I just, I have this little jar of oil. Now, when it says jar of oil, it's literally a flax of oil. It would have been just a little bit of oil. Some of you have little containers with anointing oil. It would be a lot like that. That's what she would have. Now, oil was valuable in that day. They used it for cooking. They used it to light their homes because they'd put it in lamps. They'd even use it to anoint physical bodies for various reasons, including religious reasons. So oil was valuable in that day, but she only has this little flax. Look at verse 3. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. So she's to go out and she's to gather as many vessels as she can. And here's my third observation. Step out in faith with great expectation. Now, I want you to think about it. Her going out to get these vessels would have been a step of faith. Because she lived in a town, a small town. A town in that day where everybody knew everybody and knew their business. The people knew the problem she was in. And when she went to the neighbors, they would know what she's going through. And she comes, and they're maybe thinking she's going to ask for money. She's going to ask for financial help. But instead, she simply asked for vessels. Makes no sense. It would have been a bit embarrassing. It would have been a bit confusing to people. What is this woman doing? Why is she asking for vessels and empty vessels? But it was a step of faith. It's desperate faith. So she didn't care what people thought. And sometimes we have to get there. Because too many of us are hindered in believing God because we're not desperate enough. We're not desperate enough. As long as we have potential options, as long as we can figure out a plan, as long as we can concoct in our mind a way we can get out of it, too often we don't depend on God. And I understand this because I tend to think that way. But she is going to trust the word of God. She's going to trust what God has told her through Elisha. And she has a high level of expectation. Because she finds through her sons who go out every pot, every jar, every container, every cup, anything she can possibly find. You see, the level of her expectation is seen in how many pots she gathered. What about our expectation in prayer? I think it's sad that so many of us pray, but with little expectation. It's almost like we're to pray because we're supposed to pray. But we don't really expect God to answer that prayer. I've seen people who've been praying for things and God answers it. And then they try to figure out why it really wasn't God who answered that prayer. There was something else that happened. Some circumstance, some situation. I've seen people healed, miraculously healed. And the father comes and says, well, there's probably a scientific reason for this. Why not just believe that God answers prayer? Listen to me. If you're praying for rain, which I haven't prayed for rain in a long time. But if you're praying for rain, bring an umbrella to the prayer meeting. That's the expectation we should have. In your life, if you're believing God for a miracle, believe God for a miracle. And begin to act as if God will answer that miracle. So for instance, let's say you're struggling in your marriage and you're praying for God to give you a strong, healthy marriage. Ask yourself, how do people act who have a strong, healthy marriage? And begin to act that way. If you're believing God for a closer walk with him, well, just start acting like people do who have a close walk with God. If you want to be a generous giver and you want to be a person who funds ministry. We'll start acting like a generous person. This is how a generous person acts. It's an expectation. 
It's believing that the God who asks us to call out to him will answer our cries. So she's calling out for empty vessels. And they're bringing in empty vessels. Well, that doesn't seem to help much. All she's getting is more emptiness. <laughs> right? I mean, she didn't have anything. And she didn't have anything to fill whatever she had. Now she's getting more empty things that she needs to fill. So she's getting emptier and emptier and emptier. And sometimes you and I need to get emptier and emptier and emptier. Because again, we tend to... Trust in information and techniques and methods and gimmicks. And God says, I want you to trust me. That's why in Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they're going to be filled. God is saying, I want you to be empty. You know, the other night we were going out to a dinner, and I knew it was really going to be good, and I really wanted to enjoy it, so I skipped lunch. Because I didn't want to be full when I went into that meal. I wanted to be hungry because I have discovered that no matter how good the food is, if you're not hungry, it doesn't seem that good. But if you were really hungry, the food doesn't have to be that spectacular, but boy, it sure tastes good. And for some of us, we fill ourselves with the things of the world where the things of God look insignificant, unimportant, and undesirable. That's why Jesus said we've got to empty ourselves. The prodigal son. He didn't come back to the father until he lost everything and he came to the end of himself. And a lot of times, the emptier we get, the more room we have for God to move. So she's getting emptier and emptier and emptier. And verse 4, and when you have come in, says Elisha, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all these vessels and set aside the full ones. Now I want you to see something. She is told to shut the door. Now, one thing she's shutting the door on, which is interesting, is Elisha. Elisha's not going to be there for the miracle because this is between them and God. Again, I want to say, we do not have a mediated relationship with God anymore. You don't have to have the man of God or the woman of God to see the miracle of God. He has given direction. Now they're going to experience it. And they're to shut the door. What are they to shut the door on? They're to shut the door on unbelief. And that is my next observation. Shut out all doubt. Now, this shutting out is very common in the scripture. In fact, Elisha did it another time. As you go on down this chapter, you're going to see where he raises the Shulamite son from the dead, but first he shuts the door. Or remember Jesus when he goes to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. He drives out the mourners and then he shuts the door. Or I want you to remember when Peter does a similar thing, when he raises Tabitha from the dead, he drives out those who are weeping and mourning and shuts the door. Some of us need to shut the door when we're believing God. You know, silence in the face of evil is evil, but silence in the face of unbelief is wisdom. We need to shut the door to the unbelief. And let me tell you, her neighbors would have had every reason why what she was doing was stupid. I think that's one reason she sent her sons out instead of going out herself. She was saying, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear how ridiculous this is. I don't want to hear how stupid this is. I don't want to hear why this won't work and how God didn't do it for this person and didn't do it for that person. I know what God has told me, so I'm going to shut the door. I'm just going to shut the door to all of that. And we have to shut the door. Sometimes we have to shut the door to common sense. Now, God is not a God who doesn't believe in reason. We can have reason with God. It's just that God's ways are above reason. And a lot of things we can't figure out. And i got to tell you, this has been a struggle for me in faith. Because I'm a person who likes to know how everything is going to work out. I like to have a plan. And then I like to have a backup plan. And then I like to have a backup plan to my backup plan. And God seems to keep bringing me into a position where I have to trust him more and more. Where I have to see God move or it's not going to happen. That I can't do it. There's no way this can happen. So I'm just going to have to trust him. So we have to sometimes block out common sense. And sometimes we have to block out feelings. In fact, a lot of times we have to block out feelings. Let me tell you, feelings are terrified of things like this. 
When God tells you to go out into the unknown, when he tells you to step out of your comfort zone, your feelings are going to want to run the other way. And we live in a society that lives by feelings. If you've watched Disney movies, you're told again and again, follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart. That, that's what you're told to do. And yet Jeremiah says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Unless you've been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, your heart is desperately wicked. You can't trust your heart. You can't trust you because your feelings, your heart, your desires that you have in you so often are contrary to the will of God. So you have to say, feelings, shut up. I'm going with the facts of God's word. And so she has to shut the door. She shuts the door to all of this confusion and all of this doubt and unbelief. Look at verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now, I want you to think how ridiculous that would be. She has a flask of oil. She has a sea of pots. And now she's to take this little flask and pour it into the pot. Now, you know what's going to happen. She's going to pour it. It's going to be gone, and there's still going to be 100 pots sitting there. No, she starts to pour, and it just keeps coming. And it just keeps coming. And they fill one pot, then they fill the next pot, then they fill the next pot, then they... I would love to have seen the look on their faces. As pot after pot is being filled by the oil. And here's my final observation. Pour out what you have. Again, I want to come back to it. It's not about what you don't have. It's what you do have. It's not about what you don't have. It's what you do have. I think this works on a regular basis in ministry. I remember when Kelly, I had to approach my wife and say, honey, I believe God is calling you to preach the word of God. I believe she, he's calling you to teach the scripture from the pulpit. And she essentially said, get behind me, Satan. She was really struggling with it. And I remember the first time she got up to preach, she said, I really don't have anything. I don't have anything. I don't know what I'm going to share. Well, she got up there and she shared the little bit she had. And then she had a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. And finally, I'm saying, honey, it's time. It's time to end that. See, we, got a, we got enough here. We got enough oil. We got enough flow here. And she's just kept pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. Because you give what you have and God gives more. And it just keeps flowing. It works with love. You know, there are people that are very unlovely. And there have been times when I've stepped out, people who've hurt me, who've wronged me, who've done me wrong, and I've decided I don't feel like it, but I'm going to love them. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to reach my hand out to them. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to forgive them. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to pray for them and pray good for them. That's how it works. Because as you do it, the flow begins to come, and the feelings eventually catch up with your faith. So you have to pour. You have to pour. Verse 6, now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. <laughs> and he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. I want you to think about it. As long as they had a vessel, they had oil. And as soon as the vessels were all full, the oil stopped. As long as they were pouring, it kept coming. And for some of you, you've got to just keep pouring. You say, but I'm not seeing a whole lot come out. Keep pouring what you have. Keep pouring what you have. Keep pouring what you have. And it'll start flowing and flowing and flowing. Verse 7. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go and sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Now, I want you to see this. Not only did the oil pay to cover the debt, but it was more than enough for them to live on. One of the names of God is El Shaddai. He's not just enough, but El Shaddai is more than enough. He is more than what you need. There is no limit to God. Most of us tend to have a scarcity mentality that there's only so much. 
And we have to divide it among all of us. And we've got to hold on to what we got. Because if we give it up, then we're going to lose it. But the scripture says we need an abundance mentality. Because we have a God who's more than enough. He does, according to Paul, exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. And God does operate in that way. As Kelly and I were studying this text this week, we could not help but think of a couple within our church. Ty and Amy Shandy. Because they were in a similar situation. They had gotten into business and to their own record and their own testimony, they had done things they shouldn't have done in business where they were trying to meet a payroll and so didn't pay taxes. And it caught up with them. They had to repent of it. But what ended up happening is they were in $617,000 of debt to the IRS. I think they're even in worse shape than this woman. And in addition to that, they had other debt. And they had no idea how they were going to pay it. Well, as I said, in our emptiness many times is where we find God. And they came to the end of themselves. And they fully submitted and surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. And one of the first things they thought is, we need to tithe. We need to tithe. Now, i got to tell you, that doesn't make any sense. If you tithe, you're giving away, you're going to get emptier. And your problem is, you're too empty. You owe money. You need to pay off the bills. Why are you tithing? But that's what they did. And not only that, God spoke to Ty and Amy to give away that year $36,000. Now, you got to understand this. Their income at the year was only double that amount. In fact, less than. This was over 50% of what they had expected to bring in in salary that year. Now, that is nuts. That is absolutely crazy. That's more crazy than going out and gathering up every jar and every pot you can find. How is this going to work out? It seems ridiculous. How are you going to explain this to the IRS in your hearing? I mean, this makes no sense. So Ty didn't know how they could possibly do this other than pouring out a little at a time. So he decided every day when he first woke up in the morning, he'd pull out his church app and he would give $100. So every day he started giving $100. First thing in the morning, he'd pull up the church app, give $100. Every day, every day. He had no idea where the money would come from. But every day, $100. Because God had said, $100, $100, $100. And slowly God began to bring in business. Slowly the financial wheels began to turn. And within nine months, they had paid off all the money they owed the IRS. Now, how do you explain that? You can't. Other than God, they didn't win the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. They didn't have some prince from Ethiopia give them a big bunch of money on the internet. You know, none of that happened. What happened was they obeyed God and poured out and poured out and poured out. And it just kept flowing. And it just kept flowing. And it just kept flowing. And since then, they were able to sell their business. Ended up being able to retire early. And Amy now is getting ready to run for school board for District 20 because now she has the time to invest in our next generation of young people. Folks, it's amazing what God can do. Now, I got to say that I cannot in any way guarantee you that if you do what Ty and Amy did, you'll see similar results. But I can tell you God is faithful. And God is true to his word. And God's method is a little at a time as we pour out what we have. You know, I told you about my carpet cleaning maintenance business that we had. And we reached a point where we knew we had to sell it. We sold part of the company. And then the people we sold that part of the company to defaulted on their loan. Isn't that incredible? They defaulted on the loan. So what ended up happening is we get the company back without any of the customers we had before. So what are we going to do? Well, let me tell you, I thought it was Publishers Clearing House, but it wasn't. It was pouring out the little I had. Much like Ty and Amy, I'd committed my life to Christ, and I started tithing, and I started giving, 
and I started trusting God. God, there is a way. It seems there is no way. The creditors are going to come calling, but there's got to be a way. And one day, one step at a time, God worked out every detail. And without going into detail, he totally delivered me from all of that debt in a supernatural way. Now, isn't that something? Well, not according to the scripture. That's just how it works. You pour out what you have and God brings in more. Now, whatever you need, let me tell you, God is more than enough. And one of the things we saw here is the working of the gifts of the Spirit. It's called the working of miracles. We've seen it before. Remember the axe head floated? At the end of this chapter, they're going to have a little knapsack of bread, and Elisha's going to bless it and give it out, and a hundred people are going to be fed. Sounds a lot like the loaves and the fishes that Jesus passed out. It's a working of miracles where God supersedes the natural order to do something that is miraculous. And God is a God of miracles. You know, I've never had that happen with bread. I've heard of missionaries around the world that have had a similar situation to that. But one day I was traveling. And in fact, at that time in my life, I was in traveling ministry. Every weekend I'd go to a different church and I'd speak at that church. Well, uh, one weekend I was in liberal Kansas and I had ministered, I'd preached the word of God and, and I was headed to Great Bend, Kansas for my next series of meetings I was going to go to. So I'm leaving liberal and I notice I'm almost out of gas, but I remember about 20 miles down the road, there is a gas station. So I'll stop there. I get to that gas station and it's closed. And I'm thinking, should I go back or should I venture out and see what's ahead. Well, it's getting late, and I'm in Kansas. And I foolishly decide to go ahead and drive forward. So I drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. Finally, there's a gas station. It's closed too. So I drive and I drive, and my tank goes to E, and then it goes below E. And at that point, I am crying out to God. God, I need you, because here's what I knew. I'm in the middle of Kansas. If my car stops and I run out of gas, I may not get found for a few months. So I am calling out to God. God, intervene and help. And I just keep driving and driving and driving. And on an empty tank of gas, I go over 100 miles before I find a gas station. I get to the gas station. This, uh, this is truly what happened. I pull up to the gas pump and my car goes bloop, 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 and dies. It's out of gas. And I'm able to fill it up. My car runs and I go on down the road and I'm saying, God, thank you for miracles that overcome my stupidity. Thank you, God. Folks, this stuff is real. God really works with our stuff. God really does miracles. God really responds to our cries. We have a God who no matter what situation you're in can bring you through and you can come out better for the experience. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person in this auditorium. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, whether on radio or on the internet, because I know there are people listening to me today that have deep need, that have situations where they need a miracle. Could be a relational situation, a financial hardship. It could be any number of things. But Father, we thank you that you're El Shaddai. You're more than enough. You're a God that responds to the cries of your people. That you are a God who is faithful to his word. So today, Lord, I pray that you would give a word to every person in that situation. You would show them clearly what's in their hand. And instead of thinking about what they don't have, <laughs> that today they would recognize what they do have and how you can use that to bring them not only out of their situation, but to bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.